two, all right. Perfect, it's gonna just grow bigger. Welcome, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this talk is about Elixir. It's really nice to be here because this is an Elixir conference and I'm pretty used to those, but I'm not used to other types of conferences, so that's it's a nice change of pace. Um, this is my username on the internet. My name is Andrea. I work at a company called community.com where we do like messages and stuff. Um, we're hiring, so if you wanna go, we're hiring based on, like you, you know nothing, so if you wanna go come talk to me uh, because you're excited about this, come talk to me after. Um, I'm a member of the Elixir core team, so we're gonna talk about the Elixir programming language, and I come from Italy, so I wanna talk about Italy just for a second, and what I think is the best export that we have from Italy, the things that I like that we export the most, which is Italians that are mad at other people for doing food wrong. It's just, uh, this is like an excerpt from an article that says like American exchange students in Italy start fired by cooking pasta without water. There are cooking failures and then there are cooking failures so bad that you piss off the entire country of Italy. So that's the idea. Um, and especially Italian people are very, very mad, usually at Americans, because they butcher Italian food, I guess. Um, and there's this uh, Twitter account that I really like. It's called Italian Comments. Are there any people from Italy here? Before I, okay, I see one at least. Sorry, it's gonna be like terrible for Italy, this, this next part. Uh, so let's just read a bunch of comments that the Italian people have made about food. And we're gonna talk about elixir from us, but this, this is way more fun. Uh, obviously, there is no spinach chicken pasta recipe in Italy. In Italy, a recipe like this is a crime worse than a murder. Anyway, first one. Second one, a world war won't be enough to forget this. Just very passionate Italian. Uh, very common recipe used in, Ital in Italy to cause what, what we call cono del potere. Translation, cone of the power. That is a huge and uncontrolled vomit explosion. There you go. Uh, this is directed to America, particularly. We're just here to watch you burn one chicken, parmesan, four cheese, mozzarella, taco, pasta, alfredo at a time. It's perfect. Uh, just short but sweet. Easy to hang over meal, isn't it? To vomit the last crap out. Perfect. Uh, just like people that are just accepting, I really don't understand why you do this, it's just like defeated people. Uh, there are people that see it the, the, like in a positive way, like so happy that there is an ocean between us guys, right? <laughs> uh, and then the one that I like the most, we're not just offended, we're actually vomiting. We're actually vomiting. Uh, so this is the best thing I like about Italy. Um, but we are, are in Helsinki. And I have a story about Helsinki as well. So I have friends in Italy that uh, play for the um, Italian floorball. Um, team, do you know what floorball is? Everyone knows, right? Yes. Um, so they uh, they were about to come here in 2002 or something. They were about to come here to Helsinki to play the World Floorball Championships, like two or three of them. So they have an idea. They say, why don't we make shirts for like Italian shirts that look like this, right? With like the Italian flag and like World Championship, World Floorball Championship. Helsinki written on them so that we can like trade them with players because that's something you do in a bunch of sports So they want to trade them with players. So they make they order like 70 of these shirts, right? Uh, so a few days so the day that they're going to fly here They go to the guy that prints shirts um, and they say yeah, we come to like get our 70 shirts uh, With Helsinki written on it and the guy gives them these shirts, right? Uh, and they say like what? This is, this is, and the guy goes like, what's wrong? I mean, like, did you check the spelling? And the guy just goes, goes like, world, W-O-R-L-D, yeah, this is correct, championships, this is correct, Helsinki. And they say like, but it says Helsinki, not Helsinki. And the guy says, yeah, Helsinki. Like I checked the spelling of every word, but Helsinki is Helsinki, Helsinki right? Um, so they, so he just like didn't, didn't know the spelling of this, and he checked every other word very carefully, except this. And when they told like, this is spelled Helsinki, you know? And their answer to, from this guy was like, yeah, but who's gonna know this? <laughs> In Helsinki, right? Who's gonna know this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm done with like, just the craft. Um, let's talk about Elixir. Um, so Elixir is a language that was born in 2011. Uh, so it's pretty young. Uh, 1.0 got in uh, um, in 2014, so a few years ago now. I started working in Elixir right around this time. In 2016, I joined the core team, the Elixir core team. Uh, now it's 2019. I think Elixir is 
pretty old because this is well, an hacking news. Like we'll just still pick collector in 2019. So I guess we made it. Uh, we're like our old stable language. <laughs> so um, and Elixir is just basically similar to what Clojure is for Java, but for Erlang. So it's um, something that compiles. It's a language that compiles to Erlang virtual machine. So Erlang has a virtual machine, same thing as Java, um, and it, that runs bytecode. And Elixir compiles to Erlang virtual machine. Um, it's a little bit different than Clojure because Elixir. It's, it's closer to Erlang for many things because it, sh it has exactly the same data types. So for many things, it's just syntactic sugar over Erlang. So it has the same data types, same um, ideas with processes, and um, the, the VM is the same. Uh, but it adds a bunch of stuff on top. So you can do a bunch of things in Elixir that you can't do with Erlang, like uh, meta programming, for example, or the way we do it in Elixir. Uh, we have some stuff like protocols that you have in Clojure as well um, that you can do on top of Erlang, right? Um, so Erlang itself is a pretty old language. It's like end of the 80s. Um, and it was built to power telephone systems. So you would run Erlang on telephone switches, and Erlang will handle incoming and outgoing calls, and it would handle being connected to other telephone switches. Um, and so it had a bunch of requirements for having, like, building, like, what was effectively distributed systems um, that would run on, like, these small telephone switches, and they would have to be up. So I'm going to see how this matters later on in the talk. But um, this is how Elixir looks like, just so you're exposed to it. Um, it's, this is like a module definition. We're defining the module hello. We're defining a functions, function inside it called world. And then we're printing something. So this is just like that's a string. This is just so you have an idea what Elixir looks like. Um, so I, uh, like according to Richard's talk like that is earlier, functional programming is now like a cool thing. So Elixir is functional. There you go. Um, but this is uh, like it's kind of the like it does, it's not really a feature. It's just uh, it's just functional because of requirements that we're going to explore later. But it has all the functional stuff that you expect, like it's immutable data structures. It has higher order functions. It has tail call optimization to build uh, recursion. So it's like the stuff kind of run of the mill stuff that you expect. Um, this is how immutability looks like. So, for example, if you have a map with a conf name, um, and then you create a new map, where by and you change the conf key to some other value, and you try to get the conf key back from the old map, the old map didn't change. So this is just an immutable data structure. Probably everyone knows what I'm talking about, but just to be on the same page. Um, so the original map can't be modified. You have I order functions. So for example, here we're mapping over a list and passing a function that just doubles the element. Um, so it's pretty regular uh, functional programming concepts. One thing that Elixir and Erlang have that, so when I say Elixir, I mean Elixir and Erlang really for most things. Um, so I'm just going to say Elixir. But one thing that Elixir has is pattern matching, which is not unique to Elixir. but it's pretty unique to Elixir uh, when done this, ex this extensively and when it's this powerful. So um, Prolog, I think, has this as well. Um, now a bunch of language languages like JavaScript are introducing like some kinds of pattern matching, but this is very powerful. I'm going to show you how. Um, the idea is that with pattern matching, you're, you define the shape of uh, something instead of defining, instead of just um, going in and finding the pieces of oh, data that you need, right? So in Elixir, the Equals is, an is not an assignment operator. It's a pattern matching operator. Uh, it can be an assignment operator if the left is just a variable, but that's just a special case of pattern we're going to see in a second. So the idea here is that we have a variable called my list that contains a list, and we're saying it has to match. When we use equals, it means it has to match what's on the left side, and what's on the left side is a shape. So it's a shape, and it's a list. The brackets are for the list. And it has three elements. So the first one, it has to have three elements. Otherwise, it won't match, because the shape is different if it doesn't have three elements. And then it's saying the first element should be just anything, but I want to give it the name first. So I'm going actually binding the variable. Uh, the second element is just underscore means whatever, and I don't care. And the third element is a value, and it means like I'm actually wanna, I actually want to match on this value. Um, and this is very powerful, because you can um, it's a very, very powerful, let's say, uh, flow control structure, right? Because you can match on, on single things, but you can match on the general structure of, of things as well without having to do a lot of if and end checks. Uh, and Elixir and Erlang use pattern matching for control flow as well. So for example, you have 
case, which is the, the kind of lowest abstraction for control flow, where you have an expression, and then you decide what to do based on the pattern that it matches. So in this case, for example, if it's an exact value, like one, you can do something. It's a, if it's a tuple, the, which is kind of a list, like the br brackets are for tuples, but if it's a tuple with two elements, whatever they are, just do something else, and if it's something else, like underscore other just means whatever else, uh, then do something else. So it's just a way to do very, very powerful control flow that doesn't rely on like booleans and a lot of conditions, but it relies on the shape of the data. Um, this is used pretty extensively in Elixir, but uh, so it's a, it's a really nice feature. And then a nice feature that it has that uh, it's coming to a lot of languages as well. It's been there in a bunch of languages too. It's the pipe operator. So the pipe just basically, I switch the order of the slides. Yes, this is the first slide, pipes. Um, and pipes let you convert something like this where you have a request. If you look at the center of the slide, there's a request. And then there's function that expand on the request. Like you're adding the course headers. And then on the result, you're calling set session. And then on the result, you're calling put cookie. Uh, usually you want to write something like this in like a no more normal way, of course, uh, where you have like request equals uh, something. And then you say um, request equals set session on the previous request. So you build on that. So the pipe operator just lets you do something where you, you pass the, the value of the first expression as the first argument of the next expression. So it lets you express pipelines of things where here you have a request, and then you're passing it down to add course headers, and then you're passing the result of that as the first argument to set session, and then the result as the first argument, and it just lets you express pipelines of transformations, which is super, super useful in functional programming languages because you're just transforming data a lot of the time, right? So it, it's really nice to have visually and um, semantically just be a pipeline of things. Uh, so these are just features that Elixir provides for like the, the, the pretty low level feature uh, and features and they don't really make or break the language. I think what makes or breaks the language and makes the language in particular is concurrency. Uh, so that's the strongest feature I think that Erlang and Elixir provide. And we're, so we're going to talk extensively about concurrency just to try to understand why it's so important. And the idea with this talk is that you're not going to be Elixir experts by any means by the end, but hopefully you're going to be exposed enough to Elixir so that you kind of know what it's about and kind of know what, what, what the, I mean, if there's a fuss, what it's about. Um, and then you're going to kind of know the multiple concurrency model that Elixir exposes, and hopefully you can maybe even bring it to your um, programs. So. The idea with concurrency starts with processes. So um, processes are the smallest unit of life in an Erlang and Elixir program. So the, 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 the smallest thing that's actually doing something that, that, that has life on its own. Um, when I say process, I don't mean operating system processes. So Erlang and Elixir processes are virtual machine processes, which are much, much lighter uh, um, than, than uh, uh, threads or operating system processes, so they take much less resources. You can spawn hundreds of thousands of them in the same machine, and they push this to like millions of processes in the same machine, and the machine wouldn't break as wet, so they're really, so they're really cheap to create, right? Like we, we tend to create them a lot because they're very, very cheap. Um, the process itself is always sequential, so the code that runs inside a process is always sequential, so it's just a bunch of instructions, and the process is only doing one thing at a time at any given time. It's just doing one thing. It's like one instruction, and then it goes to the next, and then it goes to the next, and just doing one thing at a time. And that kind of like resembles the way um, I like to think about this as like people work. So it's not like a one-to-one -one analogy, but a process is kind of like the brain of a person where we can only really do one thing at a time, right? Um, or rather, we can only really think hard about one thing at a time. We can think of two things at the same time very easily, right? Multitasking. They say it doesn't exist, so uh, I like to think about this uh, in the same way. Um, in an Erlang system, you have, I mean, processes as the smallest unit, but Erlang systems are, or Elixir systems are actually made of many processes that coexist. And so this process is just, each one is doing different things. Um, so it's similar to people, right? Where we have people, everyone is doing a thing about their own things. Um, Let's just super quickly see how you create a process. So to create a process, you just call spawn, and you just give it a function. So spawn just executes the function that you gave it in another process. Uh, there's no parent-child relationship in Erlang and Elixir processes, so every process is the same. Uh, and you can create processes from any process, so you don't have a tree of processes. You just have a flat structure. Um, I really like to think about, we're going to expand on this, but I really like to think about this analogy when you're thinking about Erlang and Elixir processes. They are, to your local system, 
kind of what nodes are to a distributed system. So there's a lot of semantics that are shared between processes and nodes in the way that you communicate between processes and the way you handle errors and all this stuff. And we're going to look at that uh, from look at that a little bit later on. And we're going to see how this makes more sense. Um, the property, uh, one of the most important properties about um, processes is that they are isolated. Uh, so first of all, one thing is that they run concurrently, right? So you have multiple processes. They are the virtual machine schedules them, takes care, of, takes care of scheduling them, and they run concurrently, meaning that at any given time, depending on the core of your machine, if you have more than one core in your machine, then the, there's actually going to be two or more things happening at the same time in different processes, possibly, right? Uh, if, even if you are in one machine, they're scheduled concurrently, uh, which is slightly different, but just means that the processes it, themselves are actually scheduled, uh, they're actually intertwined or interleaved. So y a process is going to like do something and then pass to another process, and then the process is going to do something, and then it gets descheduled. So it appears as parallel, but the idea is that you always write a system as if it's parallel, and then sometimes it's just going to be on a single core, so it's going to be concurrent, but the idea is that it's anyway, like the semantics are that you're writing parallel programs. Uh, one of the things I like the most about this is that processes are isolated. So that, this means that the um, processes, they don't share anything. Um, so the, the um, semantics are that if a process, for example, crashes, it doesn't affect any other process. Um, if a process takes up too much memory, it doesn't affect uh, any other process. In fact, processes have their own memory. So each process has its own heap, its own stack. Uh, they're, they have, they're just their own thing, right? Every process is, is its own thing, and it's isolated from other processes. Um, this is super nice for something like garbage collection, as you can imagine, because if every single process is isolated, we don't need to do global garbage collection, right? Because every process has its own memory, and it can't access the memory of other processes because they're isolated. So we can do garbage collection per process, right? So every process can take care of its own garbage collection. This is pretty powerful because it means that you, can, you don't have a stop the world garbage collection out of the box. You don't have to do anything. You just The garbage collection is distributed nicely uh, across your system, right? But if you don't share anything, and you don't share memory, how do you share state between processes? So many times you, you need to share state between processes, right? And the way you do that is um, a message passing. Um, and again, this is like, I really like the analogy of processing being people here, because the only way you can tell someone else something is to tell, like, tell them, right? Like, you have to send them a message somehow. Um, you can't just, like, telepathically tell them, or you can't share memory with someone else. You have to tell them so that they know, right? And now they know this thing as well. And it's similar how it works with processes. So the way you do sharing of information between processes is by sending messages. And when a process sends a piece of data to another process, it, the piece of data is copied over to the other process. So you're just copying the data over to the memory of the other process. And this is how our things work, kind of, right? Like, if I'm telling you something, I'm just, you're copying it into your memory so that we both know about it. And now the notion is independent. It's not if I destroy my memory, it doesn't affect your memory, right? And this is exactly the same thing. Now, if P1 garbage collects data, for example, it doesn't really affect P2 in any way because the data is being copied, right? And now it makes sense why this language is functional because the idea is that if you have functional programming and if you have immutable data structures especially, then it's much easier to build this system because potentially you can say, I'm not going to actually copy the memory. I'm just going like, to send a pointer to the other process because the data can change itself, right? Because it can never be mute mutated. So you can potentially just like, count references to the, to, that, to the piece of data for garbage collection. Um, it's not what actually happens for most things because of how other things work, like garbage collection, for example, but it happens for some things. And it makes it easier to implement a system like this or a programming language like this where you have to copy memory when you're sending messages or you don't, uh, you don't necessarily have to copy the memory physically to the other process's memory space. Um, the way you send a message in Elixir is pretty straightforward. You just send, and you get, give it a PID. That's a process identifier that uniquely identifies the process. That's what spawn returns. Uh, it returns the PID of the process, and you send a piece of data. Here, I'm just sending the string hello, but it can be anything. Sending is asynchronous, so you're not going to know if the the destination process received the message, or if it processed it. And like it rings a bell, right? Because if you have a distributed system and you're sending messages, messages between nodes, you don't really know if the message got there, right? 
you only know if the other node tells you that it, the message got there. Otherwise, you have no idea. So it's a fire and forget operation to, I mean, an HTTP request is a fire and forget operation as well, right? You can't know if the HTTP request got there until you get a response. Um, and this is the same idea here. You like when you're sending a message, you're just blindly sending it to the process, and hopefully, the process gets it. It's a little bit stronger guarantees because it's guaranteed that if the processes are on the same node, then the other process is going to get it at some point, but you don't know when, and you don't know if it's going to process it, right? So when you when you have a process that sends a message to another process, the other process has to actively receive that message. So if it's not actively receiving, the mes message is still going to be delivered to the process, but the process won't see it right away. It will only see it as soon as it receives. So receive is a blocking operation, and it just says, I'm blocking this process until a message gets in this process. And the idea is that it's not busy, busy wait or anything. It's just the process is going to go to sleep until it gets a message from like in, in its inbox, basically. And then it wakes up and processes a message. Um, you have like a keyword for, for receiving messages. So you have received do. And you get the message. And then when you get the message, you execute the action that corresponds to the message. So in this case, we're just printing the message. So if you have a thing sending, as we said, if you want to know if the message got there and the receiving, the receiving process processed it, you want to have acknowledgments, right? You want to have acts. It's the same thing in, uh, in general in node-to-node -node communication, right? When you make a request, you really want the other node to tell you that it got the request and that it processed it in order to know that that happened. So you have acts in a bunch of Acts are very general semantic. In HTTP, the act is the response, right? Like until you get a response, you don't really know that the uh, that the request was processed and handled. When you get the response, that's kind of the act, you know, the, 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 that it got processed. Um, so the way that a request between processes would work is that basically you have P1, the first process, send a message to P2. So that message gets delivered to P2. Then P2, and then P1 just goes into receive right away. So it goes into, uh, uh, it starts leaving until it gets a response. So it blocks and doesn't do anything else. P2 receives the message, then it processes it, and then it sends an acknowledgement back. And then P1 receives the acknowledgement and knows that P2 uh, delivered, processed the message and, uh, and handled it. Like in, uh, so this is how it would work in um, code. So you would send this destination page. You're just sending a message. I'm tagging, that's a tuple, as I said, and I'm using self, which gives me the PID of the current process, just so that the other process knows where to send the message back. So if you've ever used, for example, RCP, uh, RPC, sorry, over RabbitMQ, it's kind of saying like the reply queue, right? Reply to, so just saying where to reply, that, that self. Um, so I'm sending a message and then I'm starting already to receive and I'm waiting for a response. Uh, that colon add response is just an atom. I think you have those in Clojure as well for those of you who work with Clojure. So it's just like a, a, a singleton value that just we use to tag stuff. So we're just waiting for a response that says add response. That's the response to our add operation and we have the response right there. A semantic that you always have, or, or most of the time when you're dealing with requests across nodes, is timeouts, right? Like when you make any kind of request to another place, even like an HTTP request, you probably want to have a timeout saying, maybe after one second, just drop the request because it's been too late, right? We have that as well, and we have that through something called after. So that's another keyword that you add to the receive. So it's the same code as before. We're just adding after at the bottom. Um, and then after 1,000, that's 1,000 milliseconds. So it's after one second. It just writes timeout, right? So a timeout doesn't mean that you won't get the message. It means that just you didn't get the message in the time frame. You could still get the message after. But this is exactly the same semantics as requests between nodes, right? Like when you're sending an, or even HTTP requests, unless you're closing the connection, if you keep the connection open, if you do a request and then after one second say timeout, you could still get the response after, right? It's perfectly like feasible that you get the response after. So you still need to like some other ways to uh, handle that, and it's the same way here. Um, and by the way, like a use case for doing requests between processes is something like like we do this all the time. And it, an example is just parallel mapping, right? Where you have a list and you want to map a function over the list. Um, where every element of the list is processed in a different process that it's spawned just to process that element of the list. For example, if the computation is expensive, this can be quite useful. Um, and the idea is that, so for example, if you have a list one, two, three, you just spawn a process that 
for each element, and you send a request to the process, and then the process sends the response and dies, and then you put the response back together in a list. So it's just a use case. Um, so as I said, send plus request plus ACK, sorry, is what we call a request, even between processes in an Elixir, in an Elixir system. Um, what happens if a process dies for some reason, if it crashes and we're waiting for the request? Um, just start, uh, so Erlang and Elixir provide an actually very useful feature to deal with that, that is monitors. So a monitor is a, a one directional way for a process to monitor the life cycle of another process. So if P1 here calls process.monitor P2, uh, then, it's gonna then if P2 dies, uh, a, message is, a special message is going to be delivered to P1 saying P2 went down, so P2 died, right? And this plus timeouts plus the blocking receive gives us a really, really good framework for doing requests between processes, right? Because the way that I do, do it now that I have all these tools is that I monitor the destination process, then I send the request, and then I receive either the response or I have a timeout or I have this down message and the little hat thing, the um, little hat character just means like match on the value of that ref and that's just a unique reference to the monitor, it doesn't really matter, but the idea is that you get um, semantics where you can send a request and then you wait for either the response or the other process to die or a timeout. The super nice thing about Erlang and Elixir though, and one of the things that I like, really sell it, is that all of the stuff that I talk about, sending messages, receiving messages, monitoring other processes, all this stuff works transparently across nodes. So if you have two or more Elixir nodes that are connected together, they are in the same cluster. You can spawn a process on another node just by having the node, um, the node name. You can spawn a process on another node. You can send messages transparently to the process. So the PID is actually unique across nodes. So when you say I'm sending a message to a PID, that PID could live in another process, right? And you can monitor processes across nodes, which means that if the process goes down, you get a message, but also if the node goes down, you get a message. So it's a lot of really nice semantics because you really, you have to write your system in a way where you take care of this stuff anyways. So when you want to distribute your system, it's much easier because you already probably wrote the stuff that you needed, right? And it's really nice because it lets you reason about, in general, reason about systems with multiple nodes, which are, I guess, like a lot of systems nowadays um, in an easier way because you reasoned about them when building your own node, right? Um, one of the features that is really praised about Elixir and Erlang is resiliency. So the idea with resiliency is that you want your um, node and your program uh, and your application to be resilient to errors, so that if that stuff goes wrong, it doesn't break down, uh, it doesn't burn, and like it just try to st tries to stay up as much as possible. Um, the idea behind resiliency in Erlang and Elixir is basically summarized by this, just like the whole point is this, have you tried turning it off and on again? Uh, what does this mean? Um, it means that when there's a problem, we want to try and restart from a known state as much as we can. So if a problem, if a process crashes, for example, because its state got corrupted or like the data that it was working with got corrupted or something like that, Erlang believes that the best thing that you can do before shutting everything down is trying to restart this process so that it restarts from a known state and hopefully the problem was like a weird thing that happened and that won't happen for a, for a little bit more so you have time to debug and see what happened, uh, but at least the whole system stays up, right? And we have a abstraction in Erlang which is, called, which is called supervisors, but basically the idea is that they are processes whose only job is to restart other processes. So we have supervisor, we call the other processes children. So the idea is that you have a supervisor that spawns a child, and then if the child dies, the supervisor restarts it, right? And this is its only job. And this is where talking about Erlang and Elixir in public gets really awkward because you're starting to talk about killing children and creating children and children dying. It's, it's very, very awkward to talk about. Uh, but that's just the terminology. So, um, so supervisors, uh, again, its only job is of the supervisor of it, of the supervisor is to uh, restart children. A supervisor can't have more child, more than one child. So you can have multiple children. Um, and I'm putting it in quotes because 
supervisor and just using it as the name of what, like for what it does, but it's actually called supervisor. So the quotes are not really necessary there. But um, so the idea is that these supervisors spawn and monitor their children so that if their children die, then the supervisors restart them from a known state. And since you can monitor other supervisors, it gets, so you can have a supervisor that supervises another supervisor. Try to say it really fast, it's really hard. Um, but the idea is that you can build supervision trees uh, pretty easily. So basically you can have a tree where just you have supervisors supervising other supervisors that supervise children, and you have a whole structure, right? Um, you have like S for supervisor and P for process there, just an example. Um, and the way that the supervision tree works is that say that the process dies in the supervision tree. Uh, so this, its supervisor will restart it and it will go just go back to the same thing. Hopefully restarting it is enough to correct the whatever got wrong, right? The state got corrupted or it got into a branch of the code where it didn't know what to do and it crashed. So whatever happened, hopefully the, the restarting it fixed it. What happens if the process keeps crashing because there's just a bug in the code? For example, if you're consuming the same message from RubyLinq again and again and the process keeps crashing. Um, the idea is that Erlang propagates the crash up to its parent. So it propagates the crash to its parent supervisor, and now the whole subtree crashes. And the idea is that maybe that process was keeping, was keeping crashing because the other children of that supervisor were preventing it from restarting it correctly, right? So the idea is we just shut down more stuff and hope that shutting down more stuff and restarting that stuff from scratch is going to actually make it, make it work, make that subtree work. And this propagates more and more and more until it gets to the top of your application. But the idea is that before it gets to the top of the application, it takes a while, right? Because you have configurable strategies for this. For example, you can say, like, I want this process to be able to restart five times in three seconds stop. If it restarts more, crash. And then you have to, like, this crash propagates slowly, but at least it guarantees that you're not going to be stuck. Oops. You're not going to be stuck in a, in a loop of um, restarting children forever, right? You're going to actually uh, try to bubble up, and at some point the whole thing will crash, but that's just uh, like li less likely to happen than in many other um, programming languages where you have to implement this flow control yourself, right? Um, so the supervisors have a bunch of strategies, so those are ways that they can restart their children. So for example, they can say restart only the child that died or restart all the children of the supervisor if any of them dies, and those are really useful, can be really useful for um, determining like how the restart of the subtree works depending on the relationship between the children. Um, we also have this tool, oops, this tool that I like to show, um, no, this tool that I like to show, uh, which is called Observer, and th this is something that like visually lets you see the supervisor, that, so that's the supervisor of an actual application, Elixir uh, or Erlang application, and you can see like it's left to right, but it's still a tree structure, right, where you have, and the, just the leaves are, processes, everything else are just supervisor that supervise out of the supervisor, so it's pretty nice to visualize. Uh, one thing that supervisor lets you embrace is a, like a model that we have in the Erlang and Elixir community, which is let it crash. Um, and the idea with let it crash is that you, you don't need to care that much about error handling and handling every possible thing that could go wrong in your program, because the worst case is that like the process just crashes and it's restarted by its supervisors, right? So you still have to do error handling for things like, if you're doing, for example, an HTTP request, you still want to handle the possibility of the connection going down. Um, but in many other cases, for example, you can usually assume the correctness of the data if you parsed it. You don't have to keep checking every time, because if, it, if the program crashes, it's usually fine. It just gets restarted by the supervisor, so you have to do less error handling, right? And sometimes you can just say, I just don't know what to do if I get here, just crash and restart. So a crash is not like seen as a dangerous thing because it's handled pretty well by the whole supervision system. Um, and I just wanted to show a, 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 like a case where this shines, I guess, where um, all the stuff that I talked about kind of make, makes sense and connects, and that's something like a web server, especially a web server that keeps persistent connections to the clients, like something like WebSockets, right? So. If you see here, we have the stuff on the left, it's just what's in the server, and we have a supervisor that supervises the TCP acceptor. So this acceptor is just listening on a port, and it's creating connection, and it's listening for connections. Um, so if this acceptor goes down, the supervisor restarts it, so if there's a bug in your acceptor, it's not gonna bring everything down, hopefully. 
Um, and then we spawn a process for every single connection that we get. Right? So we'll have a bunch of clients connected through WebSockets, and every WebSockets will be handled by a process on the server side. Right? And this is like very, very, it's a very, very nice abstraction, a very, very, very nice way to do this, because all the properties that I've described work really well for this, because each process is isolated, right? And that resembles kind of connections to clients, right? Like I don't want a connection to a client crashing to bring, to touch anything else. Like everything else should just stay the same and every, all other clients should just keep being connected to the, to the server, right? Um, and same thing goes for memory. Like I don't want uh, a garbage collection. Like I don't want a garbage collection that just blocks all clients because it's garbage is collecting uh, from the whole system. I just want it to be per client so that the client will experience this, but it's going to be very fast because it's just for that process. So all the isolation stuff that I mentioned and the supervision stuff kind of like makes this a very, very good use case. And this kind of resembles somehow the telephone switches that we talked about at the beginning, right? Because if the web sockets on the client are telephones and your, ser your connections in the server are kind of the, or your nodes actually are kind of the switches, right? So you might have, for example, someone connected to one node and then someone else connected to another node and your nodes connected together and that looks very much like the telephone switch situation that we showed at the beginning, right? So this is super nice. So hopefully you got exposed to like the idea of the concurrency in Elixir and this is like the having a, a processes that are isolated that you send requests and get responses from is kind of the actor model pretty much. So it's present in a bunch of different languages, but it's so built in into our language Elixir that it, that is really really nice to use. And like the whole language is built around that idea, right? So it's very well supported. Um, and then I want to talk about mental programming a little bit. So. This is definitely something where Elixir shines over Erlang. So Erlang doesn't really have support for metaprogramming except for the mostly this like C-like macros where you just replace the text. Um, Elixir is very much like Clojure is home iconic instead, meaning that the Elixir code is actually represented by Elixir data structures. Um, it doesn't look home iconic like a Lisp because the syntax of the code is actually different than the representation, but the AST, the abstract syntax tree, is exactly the same as it's ju just an Elixir piece of data. So, for example, the call add with the arguments one and two. Um, under the hood, the AST for the call is just a piece of Elixir data, which is a tuple with an, like, an atom at the beginning and then a list of metadata and then a list of arguments. So it's just the representation, right? Um, you have tools to create AST from the code. That's quote. Uh, you have that in Lisp as well. So. The idea is that you can quote a piece of code, uh, just written out as normal code, and then you get back the AST. Um, you can have uh, un unquoting, or like this, was, this is similar to a string interpolation, if you're not familiar with what it is, but the idea is that you can take a piece of code and just inject it into another piece of quoted code so that you can build complex ASTs. Um, and a, a lot of Elixir is built this way. It's built on top of a very, very small core. Um, for example, if you look at if, so if condition do expression and, that's just a macro. So it's just something that at compile time gets transformed to what we have uh, below, which is a case. So an if just basically is transformed at compile time to a, a case that matches on true and false and, ju and just does the conditions that the if has. Um, and this is very, like, macros are super, super far powerful. You, I mean, again, if you're programming closure, you probably know this, but being able to do this at compile time is huge, right? Because it doesn't introduce any overhead at all. And we use this, uh, this concept a lot in Elixir for one example is, is uh, logger macros, right? So all the logging statements in Elixir are macros. So that you have logger.debug, for example, you can set the compile time logging level to something higher than debug, and then all of the debug statements are just removed when you compile the Elixir code. So they're not going to be in the final bytecode, right? Which, so there's no over, overhead in adding them. Um, so that's really nice. Mo most people are going to be familiar with that here, but it's a really nice feature to have in a language. And you can do compile time work in macros. You can do all kinds of expansions of code at compile time with no cost. You can do optimizations sometimes um, at compile time so that you have no um, cost at runtime, right? So in conclusion, where does Elixir shine? 
So I think that there are a few places where Elixir is really good. The first one is web. So we have good support for, for building web servers. Um, Phoenix is the, like, definitely the, the major framework that we have in Elixir. And Phoenix supports stuff like web sockets out of the box. So you can build like, real-time applications. The whole web idea works really well with Elixir because, as I said, like, you have these processes that are a really nice unit of isolation that can map pretty well to like connections um, coming into the server. So that's really nice. It turns out that Elixir is really good at embedded systems. This is like, sur was a surprise for me, but uh, we have this like NERVS framework that lets you put Elixir on embedded systems. And as it turns out, embedded systems work, uh, like uh, play very nicely with the uh, abstractions that Elixir provides, like uh, the processes and they, uh, that you can connect internet of things. Things, for example, you can connect them together as Erlang nodes, so you can do a bunch of stuff. And it turns out it works very well. I've never used NERVS and I've never used Elixir on an embedded device, but I've seen enough talks, enough people like vouch for it, but I'm sure it works well at this point. Um, and then it's very good at orchestration. So. I really like this use case where you use Elixir just to add all the semantics that, you, that I, we talked about, like supervision trees and uh, restarting and generally isolation and controlling uh, the lifecycle of stuff. You add it to an existing system, right? So you use Elixir basically to coordinate different things uh, working together and to provide all the restart semantics and the resiliency semantics that we um, talked about. So that's a really, really good use case as well. Uh, and that's all I have. So I'm open for questions. Uh, hi, thank you for your, your talk. It's really great. Uh, just trying to mix your talk with the previous one do, that we had. Do you see the Elixir community growing in the future? Because uh, I know that Elixir comes very similar with Ruby. We have the same like Phoenix to Elixir as we have like Rails to Ruby. But like Ruby is going down and Rails also. Like, do you see like Elixir comes up of that? Um, sure. So um, I think that so Elixir itself, I think it's uh, right now it's still growing, um, and I think that Elixir uh, and well Erlang itself nailed a bunch of semantics that are coming back to like their glory, like all this processes stuff and the um, supervision semantics. It's a super nice thing that like a lot of people want in their application. So I think I see like a pretty bright future for the Beam. So that's the Erlang virtual machine and the languages that are on top of it. And Elixir, especially, I think it has a pretty nice, like a pretty bright future because it's like it's very developer friendly. Provides like good tooling, uh, good testing tools. Um, that Erlang kind of lacked for a little bit, so which which made harder made it harder to get into Erlang. So getting into Elixir is is a little bit easier. Uh, hopefully, it's going to keep growing. I'm not even sure that Ruby is actually going down. I think that's just like not hype anymore. Hopefully, Elixir like becomes not hype anymore and just becomes like if it gets as successful as Ruby, I don't care if then it goes down. Like we're we made it. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that answered the question though. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Elixir can uh, execute processes on multiple nodes. Uh, does does it auto scale? And uh, what metrics does it use for auto scaling? If it does. Um, so you. So this is. Uh, it's a good question. But uh, so Elixir and Erlang provide very non-automated support for things. So if you wanna create a process on another node, you'll have to do that manually. It doesn't like automatically create a process on another node because the load on your node is too high or anything like that. Uh, there's no support built in for like auto scaling and adding nodes. So you just have to do orchestrate all of that manually. The nice thing is that you have the same like if you have connected node, you can actually connect the nodes through Elixir and Erlang instead of having to do that through whatever or HTTP requests or RabbitMQ or whatever you use to connect nodes. So you can have running nodes that are in the same Erlang cluster, and you can have the same semantic. The, the cool thing is that you have the same semantics that you have locally for uh, for nodes that, for processes that live on other nodes as well, right? But all of the orchestration and all the kind of stuff you have to still do 
manually doesn't really provide any help with that. Does that answer your question? No. Nope. <laughs> I also have a follow-up question on resiliency. So yep. uh, does it handle it uh, gracefully when a node dies and then there were important processes like a root supervisor was there or something like that? Um, so there's, yeah, yeah, like mostly yes. So the, the, um, the, when a supervisor, when a process crashes and the supervisor decides that he wants to shut down the whole subtree, it's gonna give time to the other children to, to shut down. So usually it's not like abruptly killing anything, everything. Um, it actually gives, usually gives time to the processes so that they, they're, they're, like, they're told you're about to be shut down so you can persistate or do whatever. Uh, still, if the node goes down, there's not really much you can do. Like if you have Elixir running on a computer, you unplug it, I mean, there's no, nothing's gonna save you, right? So it doesn't really provide anything for that. Uh, but it does provide semantics for, yeah, for when, like graceful shutdown of things. Usually things are not just killed. Um, they're given time to shut down and maybe do like graceful shutdown. Any was a question over there? I'm not sure if we have time, but I saw a hand over there. That's one, that's one, that's one. <laughs> Considering the restart of the process and uh, sending the messages, how do you design stuff that happens exactly once? <laughs> Good question. Good question. Uh, you have no it, well. In the in a local node, you kind of like I, I played it like you have less guarantees that you have. You actually have enough guarantees to to when that when you send a message, it's always exactly once, right? So when you send a message to another process on a local node, if that other process is alive, uh, then you know that the the message is going to be delivered at some point that, to that process. You you don't have to wonder uh, if it got delivered it twice. It's going to just be delivered once because really. The idea of sending a message is not really realistic because it's just a memory copy over to another thing, so it's not really like it's instantaneous usually, and it's not really like sending a message through a protocol or through a connection or anything, right? So um, usually you have you don't have to worry about double delivery of messages or anything like that. So if you want exactly once, that's the pattern. Like the pattern that I showed is what you use, where you like send a message and then you want an act back so that you know that it got it, so that it's at least once. But since like the semantics on the node provide it to be, like they, ma they make it so that it's exactly once. Uh, Internode, you have no guarantees. It's exactly the same thing as any other, uh, any other system where you have messages that go through nodes. So if you send a message to another node, it could get lost on the way. So even if you, like if you wait for the act, even if you don't get it, it might have reached the the other nodes. So if you want to send it again, then you risk double delivery. So it's just like the, exactly the same thing as any other um, like node-to-node -node message communication. Hopefully that answers the question.